Hey everybody, it's Tea Tuesday, it's April 1st. Uh, uh, these were the goals for this time. Uh, I've learned to lower my expectations, make something, do something by itself, and have big fun. That was it. I am declaring y big yeses for both of those. Uh, I've got a tremendous amount of stuff I want to talk about. This update may run a little long. Maybe it'll even go 20 minutes. Uh, we'll see. Uh, if I get hung up on something, you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to talk about uh, development and community in particular. Uh, uh, and then planning can get short shrift at the end. I mean, the planning is still FPGA or TENS Torrent. TENS Torrent still kind of has the edge. So <clears throat> let's start the development by taking a look at our only uh, BV episode. Uh, a sort of a, a, a review. Yeah. And one thing to do is, is to sort of keep an eye on the brains in the upper left, even if they don't make any particular sense. Uh, uh, since we're starting almost three months ago, uh, you know, the blocks move around, the connections change, and so on. stuff packed into the hot box uh, tile to reduce the amount of hacks on those, those lines to make the signals move a little faster. I don't know how much difference it made. Yeah, we're less than a week ago. Look at this. Yeah, there's a display. <laughs> it doesn't display anything useful really yet. And here's BV's big success. attempt to get localization working before today it did not work <laughs> uh, there was a bug which I have since diagnosed uh, but have not yet uh, seen how much better BB manages to do with the bug fixed that'll be for the future and that is that so that's where BV's at. Uh, a lot of the action all along has been uh, development, brain development, but uh, let's take a look at what's going on there. So, did we achieve localization? Did BV know where it was on the grid? No. Uh, was there progress? Oh, yeah, there was progress. Uh, um, a whole new stack. <laughs> I said, right, <laughs> five years ago, yeah, 2018, oh my God, seven years ago now, uh, a whole, we need a whole new stack. So it, it begins with what we're calling Isaac indefinitely scalable array of asynchronous computers that indefinitely scalable, you can keep plugging them together. The movable feast machine is an example of Isaac. Uh, uh, it has sites with atoms and event windows that leads to the programming language ULAM, which has physics to specify how the transition functions between event windows happen. Then it leads to all the user program stuff that I've been working on for the last several years, the grids, crossbars, axons, sensory motor taps, and just in the last couple of months, a, a PID controller, a 
proportional integral derivative controller, which is a very well stu known and well studied uh, system controller uh, uh, for uh, controlling robots and, and factories and rice cookers and so forth. Uh, um, and uh, we have implemented one in Isaac. And this is the idea. There will be related tasks that we will implement in related ways, but we're trying to learn the advantages and disadvantages to spring the design bear traps and so on. Now we're on to grid navigation, localization, figuring out uh, scale so it can tell where it is on the grid and so on. There is 13,000 lines of ULAM code in the BV2025 repo now, not including uh, another 2,000 lines that are auto-generated, and it has been bug city. I mean, more than that, it's the the entire bug metropolitan area and so forth. And I think, you know, I've had all kinds of flags here and there. Are we in the middle of a turn? Well, then don't do this. Make sure you do that twice. No idea what was going on and typically didn't need to know, didn't know what was going wrong when things were going wrong. Took a tremendous amount of debugging. And I decided... What we need is a whole new language. When you got a problem, when you get too much complexity, what you need is a whole new language that will make certain things easier and certain things virtually impossible. And it's the virtually impossible that we're looking for so that we get rid of whole classes of bugs because you have to do it in this particular stereotyped way. And the language I came up with I call NAFI. NAFI is not a fourth interpreter. I'll talk about what that means. Uh, uh, but there's a little example of the code, and here is a little of uh, the uh, uh, metropolitan area, uh, and that, that little dot right there is uh, uh, a uh, NAFI interpreter. Uh, um, and so NAFI is not a fourth interpreter. Fourth is a programming language from the 70s, uh, uh, developed by, by Chuck Moore and then a bunch of other people. And it's, it's been sort of a niche language, but it, you know, absolutely real, absolutely going on the whole time, even though it was never a star language like C++ or Java or Rust or what have you, uh, or of course Python. Relative simplicity of creating a basic fourth led to many personal variants. Uh, uh, used to implement video games, used in spaceflight applications, and in other embedded systems which involve interaction with hardware. It's, they, you know, this is the Philae uh, spacecraft. Uh, uh, fourth has landed on a comet. Can your programming language say that? Uh, uh, that's pretty damn cool. That's interacting with hardware. So how does fourth work? Well, you know, it's basically a stack and a RAM and a program counter all wrapped up together in very cool ways to do very cool stuff. So for my purposes, interaction with hardware, well, BV is our hardware, even though it's sim simulated. Uh, I mean, one of the things people have often suggested, why not change the hardware to do what to get around problems in the software development? And I've been reluctant to do that because I want to take BV as the hardware. It's sort of as given, and we have to figure out what we can can do with what we got. Uh, um, now, you know, I started programming around 1973. Fourth came out around 1970. In those succeeding 50 years uh, plus, I have never implemented a fourth of my own. And I, I still haven't because NAFI is not a fourth interpreter. So, but there's a question uh, for the insiders. How could MFM and ULAM support a fourth-like language that needs stack and RAM and PC program counter? Because MFM has no RAM. All you have is these little uh, event windows uh, that have a very limited state, about 1,000 bits, or I'm sorry, I guess it's about 4,000 bits, something like that, but very small, and no general-purpose RAM accessible at all. Well... MFM can support a fourth-like language if all the code is constant. Now, fourth purists at this point are just going, you know, it's no fun because uh, changing the code as you develop it is an inherent activity in the fourth system. But here it is, you know, constant in, you know, contents of RAM, 186 ints, da 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 da, -da off it goes. Uh, um, and as long as the code is constant, then all we need is the stack and the PC. And we can make very small 
uh, uh, for example, we, I made Adam Naffy, uh, which is the stack and the program counter in one Adam. So we have a 10-bit uh, program counter. That means it can access a thousand words of constant RAM, of cram. <laughs> uh, uh, we don't have that much uh, in it, but I had you know, room to grow. And it, the stack is six entries deep. Uh, um, and, you know, here it is, like I pointed out before. That little white square is an Adam Naffy. Uh, the PC is currently at 132. Here's the stack. The stack first free is three. That means the top of the stack is two. It's got a six in it. And then below that, there's 107. Below that, there's a 92. Uh, it's executing. And this is all part of that whole region. GTCC and Loxy are the stuff I, hard coded stuff I wrote, uh, that was doing <coughs> speed control, the PID controller, and all those various kinds of things, tracking the, the, uh, changes in the grid going over light and dark patches on the floor, uh, and so on, that are all mutually accessible in the same event window as the Adam Nafi and HDT8 is the truck driver that's in charge of the whole thing. Uh, and it has actually very little stuff in it because mostly it just dishes to Adam Nafi to say, do whatever's next. And that whole thing is, you know, this tiny little spot uh, uh, in this brain, which now, like I said, ha has a display. Uh, uh, this is actually retooling uh, a font demo that goes all the way back to when I uh, gave a talk at, at uh, the University of, of California, San Diego. San Diego, where I met, well, Andrew and I crossed, uh, uh, and uh, it, now it's part of uh, Bevy's brain. Bevy cannot see the display. It's just debugging state. <laughs> But debugging for me, but it's useful to pull it all together, both for that purpose and because eventually uh, I still have ambitions to do a beer world model up there. Oh, and you know, while I was setting up this diagram to take these screenshots, uh, I, I did some uh, time travel debugging that you can do in the simulator uh, on the hot box tile here. And then when I restarted it, uh, I didn't get back to the present. So MFM detected a whole bunch of cache inconsistencies between what this tile thought, what the neighboring tile thought was going on. So, you know, errors, a whole patch of errors that led to a whole bunch of stuff being erased. BV didn't notice it at all. You cannot see any. It wrote it out. This is what it's like building on a robust first architecture. All right. Oh, yeah, there they are. Uh, NCC's inconsistent cache contents. Uh, uh, so how does Nafi work? Uh, yeah, we're going to go to 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, uh, take all the behaviors that I had hard-coded uh, for demos before, give them all names, give them numbers, uh, uh, make a configuration file that says, well, how do you do dress line forward? Well, you, get, you need, to go, need to go slow because we're trying to stay right on the line and know where we are. So max speed, three, min speed, and, when, and all we need to say is motor controller parameters. This is one of the ways to specify it. And then when we're done, and so then the motor controller will go off and do all that stuff independently. And when it detects the done function has become true, that's a NAFI function, Here's the code for it, same edge. Uh, so check the front clock, call, call a function to check the front clock, check the rear clock, see if they're equal, uh, um, and, you know, uh, that's kind of weird. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't. Uh, oh, oh, right, yeah, front, rear front operator again. Okay, so there are equal and and. I thought I had a bug there. Uh, and so forth. Uh, um, and here is the faced E spike, which in fact is what we saw running on the yesterday portion of BV's adventure. Uh, try Call a function to face to the east, turn left, here's dress line forward, call run track on it, and so on. This is the entire code, which isn't working. <laughs> The moment uh, uh, to do this. There's a similar one for trying to find the origin as a beginning process of localization, but it's not working yet. Localization achieved, no. Progress, oh yeah. Okay. Community. Uh, um, Curious Reader and Andrew at the Discord. That's uh, like a Star Trek Next Generation. 
you know, it's metaphor. Uh, uh, Curious Reader has been a long time uh, uh, participant in this project and 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 in uh, uh, Dave Ackley stuff uh, and so on. And you know, in March, it's this time of a year where I ask again to try to understand. It. So, hardware and software. Software expects hardware to be deterministic, and of course, that's one of the things we're requiring uh, uh, programmers, developers, to give up in order to move to Isaac, in order to move to indefinitely scalable asynchronous computing. Uh, um, and uh, Curious Reader also connected to uh, Andrew uh, with a plug for Andrew's blog post, Introduction to Robust First Computing. Uh, I second this uh, support. It's great. It explains it much better at a much more simple and gettable level than I have been able to do because my brain is too warped from having done it all. Uh, uh, and Andrew chimed in in response to Curious Reader, the perspective to build up in your head, which hopefully isn't too disappointing, is that 80 years of traditional computing, but down in robust, we're still just doing the equivalent of beginnings. And that's absolutely right. The atoms are appropriate names. Super simple. But focusing on doing useful stuff uh, uh, is good because it puts the whole thing into the context of a system. System. Are you doing something useful? When Dave references building bottom up, he's saying start with the system and build up from there. The other point is to mention that uh, MFM and T2 tiles are not necessarily the be all end all of the way Isaac and robust first and indefinitely scale of computing will necessarily be done. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. It's just what I could figure out to do to try to start exploring the whole architecture space, the architectural family, to push hardware and software into robust for territory. Um, and they went back and forth. I really recommend if you can stand uh, going on Discord, and I avoided it for a long time, but there we are. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, the T2 tile project Discord channel is very quiet. <laughs> So uh, uh, the announcements and, and little chit-chat like this, this is a big event. So my thoughts following up on this. So one of the things that Curious Reader was saying was, you know, can we expect to have like an 8086 uh, processor CPU built in MFM or even something simpler? And, you know, my suggestion is that's not what we should want because an 8086, yes, it's small, yes, it's simple, but it's still CPU and RAM. And my suggestion is CPU, robust CPU RAM is an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. That CPU and RAM is never going to be really robust. You can try, you can try with all kinds of things, but it's not going to work. So I think instead of thinking, when am I, I'm going to wait to do robust first until they can give me a, a, a processor that's essentially deterministic and I can keep on playing like I have been before. Instead of thinking that way, think, FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays, which are spatially distributed array, uh, but in an indefinitely scalable way. FPGAs can have soft processors, they call them soft cores, uh, um, uh, but that's not why we use an FPGA. So if we wanted to do an 8086, so there's a thing called the Microblaze, a very simple uh, uh, CPU processing that you can just plop down on an FPGA and it'll take up a certain amount of the resources and so forth. And that's great because you need sequencing. CPU type stuff is for doing sequential stuff, but you want to do as much as possible distributed, as much as possible in parallel. And that's what scalable architectures, that's what spatially distributed does. Think systems first, think bottom up. Uh, uh, thank you, Curious Reader and, and Andrew. You know, I don't know how much time I've got to keep working on this stuff and hearing other folks saying the thoughts back to me and having them make sense to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, all right. So the planning, let's skip it. Uh, we'll talk more about it next month. Again, it's what can we do for the second half of this year? And I'm thinking maybe get to try to do some spikes about how speeding things up. So. The goals for May 6th, uh, okay, localized. You know, I am the boy who cried localized, but I feel like I'm so close. <laughs> I almost thought I was going to get it for here. Also want to pick a notebook research topic. Haven't done a no no research notebook video over on the Dave Ackley channel for a long time. Any suggestions there would be great uh, and have more big fun. Thank you so much for taking a look. I hope to see you next time.